I'm Nicole Burley. It is Wednesday, September 1st. This is Rush Hour. Those top stories in just a moment. We have News Nation reporters spread across the country. And tonight we are also following breaking news out of North Carolina. A high school student shot and killed at school. That gunman still on the run tonight. News Nation live on the ground for that active search. It's underway right now. And in Colorado, three police officers, two paramedics, now facing charges in connection with the death of Elijah McClain. It's a young black man who died in police custody. What led to the decision to indict? And a tourist behind bars in Hawaii accused of making a fake vaccination card to avoid a 10-day quarantine. And investigators say a crucial typo is what tipped them off. But let's start with breaking news out of the Northeast. The remnants of what was once Hurricane Ida still being felt along the East Coast. Flash flooding reported from Maryland to New Jersey as the system inches away from the coast. Meanwhile, reports of a tornado touchdown in Maryland today. Take a look. You can see that rotating funnel cloud moving across the city of Annapolis. News Nation correspondents are fanned out across the country monitoring the latest severe weather. So let's begin in Annapolis with Evan Lambert. So Evan, are you seeing any damage out there right now? Nicole, absolutely. We are in Edgewater. Now, this is just a few miles from Annapolis, the capital of Maryland. And here is the aftermath of that tornado that the National Weather Service says was radar confirmed. It touched the ground around 2.30, we understand, but look at that house right there. Really looks like a saw just sliced off the top portion of the house, the roof. We are told by neighbors that no one was inside at the time that this happened. Maryland's Governor Larry Hogan saying in a tweet, state officials are monitoring that aftermath of the tornado that touched down here around 2.30, and we don't even have information yet from the National Weather Service about how strong this tornado was at this point, but of course, it looks pretty clear from all kinds of viewer videos from Annapolis and the Edgewater areas where you can see debris flying and that wide funnel cloud appearing to be touching the ground. We also saw the tornado do damage to a high school crushing part of the snack bar and the stands surrounding the football field and uh, that nearby storm. Again, as you can see here, slicing off the roof, some nearby houses as well. Their roofs have been damaged in this neighborhood of Edgewater, not far from Annapolis. But we understand there are luckily no injuries associated with this tornado. Again, we're waiting to find out the strength of this storm from the National Weather Service. And all those storms headed northeast of here, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, they're going to have to deal with this as well. Nicole. I'm well, glad to hear there are no injuries out there, Evan. Uh, that video is very intense. All right, well, Ida, as you can see, still not done wreaking havoc. Now a tropical depression. The storm expected to bring widespread and potentially life-threatening flooding across the Northeast. Right now, New York City is in the storm's latest bullseye, and that's where News Nation's Tom Negevin is live for us tonight. So, Tom, how do things look where you are right now? We can see it's, it's already you starting know. to come down. And coming down uh, sideways right now, kind of, Nicole, you know, you've got the umbrella. It doesn't really do much for you. It's that kind of night here in New York. As you say, Manhattan, a bit in the bullseye. The wind picking up right on cue, as is the rain. Uh, Hartford, Connecticut, also in that uh, proverbial bullseye right now. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, among the uh, latest targets of Ida, now a tropical depression. And some of the most dramatic images we're seeing are coming out of the Keystone State right now. Take a look at this. Uh, this is out of Allegheny County. Just just northeast of Pittsburgh, 40 students and a school bus driver rescued by the Cherry City Volunteer Fire Department, which went on, we're told, to save another 10 people from nearby flooded homes. Some video out of Harrisburg, PA, motorists dealing with flooded roadways there. All this rain turning rivers into torrents. They are flooding the roadways, and PennDOT is closing roads uh, across the state of Pennsylvania today, as they have been throughout the day. Uh, this is the concern here in the New York City tri-state as well. 20 million people right now in the high risk area for flooding, but around them, another 32 million people are in the area considered moderate risk. The high risk includes us here in Manhattan. Those flood watches cover an area from North Carolina 
all the way up to Maine right now, and the ground here in the northeast, up the 95 corridor, still saturated from Henri, which came through a couple of weeks ago, and what that means is the flood risk increases. That's why the risk is so high right now. There's even a tornado risk right now for parts of southern New Jersey, a risk that uh, luckily for us uh, dissipates a bit as you get closer to New York City, but some areas in this region will be seeing the highest 24-hour rain totals they have seen in a hundred years, a once in a hundred year event. The good news, I guess, if there is any to be found here, Nicole, is that the remnants of Ida should be on their way out of the New York City area tomorrow morning into midday, but uh, we're still looking to be pretty waterlogged around these parts just in time for the Labor Day weekend. Yeah, just in time for the holiday, Tom. Please try to stay dry out there. All right, let's get to Gerard Jabaley down in the Weather Center. So, Gerard, we're talking tornadoes, torrential rain, which we saw with Tom there. What's the outlook for the Northeast? Yeah, the remnants of Ida bringing a dual threat tonight, Nicole. The system is still pretty large and in charge here. Uh, large uh, system bringing tons of moisture in and a lot of dynamics, meaning there's a lot of uh, shear to create these tornadoes to spin up. So let's show you. In fact, we had one not too long ago just north of the Philadelphia metro. Radar confirmed tornado debris being lost in the air and we can see those Doppler winds very rapidly rotating so we are not done with this as we're continuing to see more uh, threat for tornadoes tonight but that's not the only thing flooding is going to be a widespread issue and we have flash flood watches including much of Pennsylvania all of New Jersey and across uh, much of the New York City tri-state area into Boston tonight we're going to be looking at several more inches of rainfall and it will be flooding rainfall anywhere from four five six inches of rainfall across much of the southern uh, portions of these states and that is going to last as we move into tomorrow and we'll likely be seeing that threatening places like Hartford, Connecticut and into Boston all the way up along the coastal areas of Maine. Once we head into tomorrow we'll start to see some things change but then that flooding threat changes to more of a river flooding threat but it's still the next 24 hours are going to be soaking potentially life-threatening flooding rainfall and then on top of that again the tornado risk as we head through later on tonight. All right, Gerard, thank you for that. Okay, let's get you to Louisiana now. Experts now estimate the total damage from Hurricane Ida could be more than $50 billion. Meanwhile, anger and frustration growing as people there try to recover and rebuild amid power outages, water and gas shortages, and of course, that intense heat and humidity that New Orleans and Louisiana is known for. News Nation correspondent Brian Enton is live in New Orleans. And Brian, some people taking some pretty extreme measures tonight. Yeah, Nicole, it's hot, and you can imagine the frustration. Still no power and still no gas in most places. We're outside the Shell Station, one of the few gas stations that has gas. Take a look at the line. It goes as long pretty much as the eye can see. Many people waiting in line for hours in their cars and also on foot. I want to show you over here come into the gas station. You can see all of these people uh, with their portable gas tanks. They've been lined up here for hours. I've seen many of them out here waiting uh, all day. They want to fill up their generators because what the officials here are saying is the power may not come back on for several more weeks. To get a sense of the desperation in New Orleans, just show up to the handful of open gas stations. You're almost on E here. Yeah, I ran out of gas yesterday. I pushed this truck seven blocks. You pushed the I've truck. been in the line since 550. The line of cars waiting for gas goes on and on and on. No AC, it's hot. Nobody's, there's no hot food. There's nobody helping with, with ice. Nothing, no FEMA people, nothing, nothing. We're, we're dying out here. We're dying. Now look at this. They, they got all these people looking for gas. Now if they shut out right now, what are we going to do? It feels like the mood has changed in the last day. People are getting more angry. Yes, it's going to be like that. You got to understand, people are out here struggling. Refrigerators are gone. There, if, if you did have food, if you bought food, how, how are you going to eat it? It's gone. The owner here says he's one of the only gas stations open because he has a generator. He's armed. Tell me about the gun here. Is that just for protection? No, just safety and just, just something. If anything, break up wrong. You know what I'm saying? There's still no power in almost all of New Orleans. At night, it's pretty much pitch black. 
This is one of the main reasons for the widespread power outages. Take a look. This massive tower fell during the storm. These lines provided most of the electricity to New Orleans. <laughs> no power means no AC, and it's so, so hot. The National Guard is giving out ice. Lines for that are also very, very long. You don't sleep. You, you know, you're running out of food. You know, you're running out of money. To, it's, it's tough. It's scary. It's scary. And just so much desperation out here, Nicole. So many people just wanting the basics. Electricity, water, and gas. Take a look again. You can see lined up out here, hoping that there'll be enough gas when they finally get to the pump. Some people sharing, actually, uh, spreading the gas around within each other's containers. Uh, this man actually showed up with the gas tank from his car. He said he tried three times today to get gas. They ran out every time. He decided to take the gas tank right off of his car, show up here, uh, hoping that he can finally fill it up. So not, not a good situation, Nicole. Yeah. Not a good situation at all. We hope that they're all able to get gas, get water, get ice. Brian, excellent reporting as always. Well, there's growing concern tonight in Lake Tahoe as the Caldor fire inches closer to the resort town. The fire crews have been working around the clock to save homes and try to contain destruction. Nancy Liu is live from South Lake Tahoe. Nancy, winds are expected to calm a bit overnight, so maybe that's offering some hope for the area. A little bit of hope, but for now, it is still pretty windy up in the mountains. Tonight, South Lake Tahoe remains shut down, evacuated. It is still intact, but there is still high anxiety because that Caldor fire is less than three miles away. More than two weeks into the fight against these flames, they remain largely out of control and on the move. The flames have yet to reach Lake Tahoe, but it's been smoked in for days. A big priority remains the evacuated resort town of South Lake Tahoe. The eastern head of this is what everyone's focused on because Tahoe is at risk. It might actually skirt South Lake Tahoe, but Heavenly, which is a, a very popular ski resort, is in the path on that top of that ridge. So they're working diligently today. Firefighter Charlie Brown spent 27 days battling the Dixie Fire and is now on day 13 fighting Caldor. Crews have been able to save hundreds of homes, but at least 500 others are gone. And we don't have too much time, uh, really, to, to dwell on any of the loss because the fire continues to move. And we look at points of opportunity to, to make the saves on the structures and and the people that we can. Gusty winds have made the battle against these flames especially tricky. In many instances, the flames have moved unpredictably to win those battles. Along Highway 50, we saw firsthand how quickly things can worsen. A small hot spot ignited several massive trees in less than 10 seconds. Crews are already stretched thin all around South Lake Tahoe. We just don't have the number of people that we really need to get around some of these things. Now, due to conditions, evacuation orders expanded across the state line into Nevada over the past 24 hours. But the good news is the winds are expected to ease up later tonight. Nicole? Yeah, we certainly hope that helps. All right, Nancy, thank you for that. Well, tonight, the search is still underway for five Navy pilots off the coast of San Diego after a helicopter tumbled off the U.S. Navy ship. Five sailors on board the USS Abraham Lincoln were also hurt. News Nation's Jeff McAdam from our station KSWB in Coronado, California. Jeff, so what is the latest on the rescue operation? Well, well, yesterday we knew that one of the six crew members involved in the crash had been found. Today we're finding out that that one sailor is now in stable condition, so that's great news. But again, still five sailors remain unaccounted for. The helicopter they're on is an MH-60S, which is a kind of a staple here in the Navy. It's been used for the better part of 20 years. It is a troop transport helicopter. We're told that it was operating on the deck of the USS Abraham Lincoln just before this accident happened. The helicopter going over the edge of the aircraft carrier and into the ocean. This happening about 60 miles here off the coast of San Diego. There were five additional sailors on the ship that were injured in this accident. Uh, three of them remain on the ship. Two more brought to shore for additional medical attention. But right now, again, the focus is on the five sailors who are still unaccounted for in the ocean. At this point, it's been nearly 24 hours since that helicopter went down. And so the concern has to be, well, what are the water conditions like out there? Looking at an oceanic map, I can 
can see that the temperatures look to be about 70 degrees, 60 miles out. And that's not really cold, but it is certainly right there on the threshold of dangerously cold. So there's a real push to find them and find them quickly. We have the Coast Guard involved with it right now as well. But the update is that one that they found yesterday, that sailor is in stable condition. The other five still remain missing. Uh, Jeff McAdam, News Nation, San Diego. I'll send it back to you guys. All right, Jeff, thank you for that. Well, Colorado's Attorney General today announcing 32 charges against three police officers and two paramedics involved in the death of a black man in Aurora, Colorado. It's now been two years since the death of Elijah McClain. He died after being sedated with ketamine during an arrest. News Nation's Ashley Michaels from our Denver station KDVR is joining us live. So, Ashley, can you tell us what are the charges? Well, yeah, Nicole, first I want to say, you know, you said that this was two years. It's almost two years to the day from when Elijah McClain died. So this is news a long time coming for folks here in Colorado. Like you said, we have five first responders facing 32 collective counts, including manslaughter for all five of those first responders. All right. So I want to take you back and sort of recap this entire case. It all started back on August 24th of 2019. That's when Elijah McClain was leaving a convenience store in Aurora, Colorado. Now, someone called 911 on him because he was wearing a mask. This was before the pandemic. And they said that he looked suspicious. So police confronted him. He ended up dying six days later. So fast forward to now and this indictment that we're now talking about. Two current Aurora police officers, one former officer, they're now facing charges uh, related to criminal activity involving his death. And that's because they were doing a carotid hold on Elijah McClain. Now that has since been banned here in Colorado because it de deprives the brain of oxygen. Then we also have two paramedics who have been indicted in his death as well. This is new information because the grand jury is calling that sedative that they gave him, ketamine, they're calling it a deadly weapon. Here in Colorado, we did pass a law this year that has limited the use of that sedative in certain instances. So very very big developments here. Now, the local police union, they're defending the police officer, saying they didn't do anything illegal here. We did hear, though, that Elijah McClain's father wept tears at this indictment, and his mother says that she has slept better since this indictment came down on Thursday. We learned about it today. The family learned about it over the last few days. She said she has slept better than she has in two years. Nicole, back to you. Yeah, Ashley, I know there are many people in the community really pushing for this, so we'll continue to follow it. Ashley, thank you for that. All right, we do want to get you to that breaking news out of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. A student shot and killed at a high school. Now, police have just taken the suspect into custody. This just came in about five minutes ago. So take a listen to police dispatch audio. This is from earlier. I got a report of gunfire at Mount Table High School. I got a student now. I just heard that student down. News Nation's Daniel Pierce from our station WGHP joining us live. Daniel, the suspect just taken into custody. This is the second school shooting police there responded to this week. A absolutely. And this right here is the first time in Forsyth County that we've had a student be shot and killed in this school district's history. I want to take you back to what we know so far. As you mentioned, that suspect has been arrested, accused of killing Will William Miller Jr., a student at the high school. The shooting happened just after 1207. And what authorities tell us is that the suspect shot them and then ran from the scene. There are two SRO agents who were inside the school. Those deputies were able to respond very quickly, but the suspect was able to run from authorities and elude them all the way up until, as you mentioned, they were just arrested not too long ago. And again, we're still trying to figure out more information about that. But as the shooting did unfold, the school district put the surrounding areas in lockdown. We we have more than a thousand students that were huddled up in classrooms in the gymnasium because authorities did not know where the shooting suspect was. And then whenever we were on campus, they were still going methodically 
through the school campus to try and clear the room to make sure that everything was all clear. And in the meantime, parents have been sitting in this parking lot about a mile from the school. It's a Harris Teeter parking lot, and they have been waiting. And right now, authorities are very meticulously and very carefully calling the names of the last initials of students so they can go to an undisclosed location, and those parents can be reunited with their kids. And it is a process that's going to last well into the evening and it's something that parents are very anxious about very tense about but again they're just very thankful and very ready to be reunited with their child that's you nicole oh yeah i'm sure those parents and students are, are absolutely terrified daniel i know you had the name of the student that uh, sadly was killed do we know his age And this time we, we heard that he was 15 years old. That is something that law enforcement released not too long ago. Still don't know uh, the grade that that child was in or even where on campus this was. And as has been mentioned before, parents have seen something like this happen in the past, but it has never happened here. And so the next step is just figuring out how do we talk to our kids about this? Where do we go from here? Absolutely. All right, Daniel, thank you for that report. Well, in Afghanistan tonight, the Taliban celebrating American troops leaving, but several U.S. citizens still stuck in the country. Straight ahead, a News Nation exclusive. Hear from an American still trying to leave. She says the U.S. government did not come through for her. Then later, you could call this Friday Night Lies, a mysterious high school football program in Ohio playing on national TV. Now the governor there wants to know, is this school even real. A grim reality setting in for Americans and Afghans stuck in the country as the Taliban steps back into power. Today, the militant group holding a military parade in the southern city of Kandahar riding on military tanks. And tonight, we have a News Nation exclusive, the story of one of those Americans, a woman, she is still stranded, despite promises by the U.S. government that no one would be left behind. D.C. correspondent Joe Khalil live for us tonight in Washington. So, Joe, I have to imagine this is just such a desperate situation for her. Yeah, it is, Nicole. And, you know, we're for her security because of that desperation. We're not going to show her face or say her name, but this is uh, an American citizen. She's been living in the U.S. since 1983. She's been a citizen for 12 years. Her kids, her grandkids, all born here. So she is certainly uh, an American, and she is stuck right now in Kabul, despite her family's multiple attempts to try to get her out, try to go through uh, multiple diplomatic channels, whether it be the State Department or others. Uh, they have not been successful so far. She actually flew to Afghanistan. Uh, back in early August. And uh, since then, when the Taliban quickly took over Kabul, she's been trying to get out saying that she went to the airport eight different times. Uh, we've seen those images, those chaotic scenes of groups of people, hundreds of people trying to get to the gates. Imagine a 62-year-old woman trying to fight through those crowds with her passport, trying to get on a plane. She was unfortunately unsuccessful in doing that. Uh, and actually, one of those trips in those hundreds of people, she was almost trampled over almost lost her life. Here's how she described that chaotic moment. A crowd of people behind me crushed and people stepped on me and kicked me four to five times. As I tried to get up, people stepped on me and you know one of my feet hurts badly. I started screaming. If I were not picked up by my nephew, I think I would have been killed in the stampede. Do you feel the U.S. government abandoned you? They did not help us. We went to the location where we were told to be, but when we showed up there, there was nobody. Now, to elaborate there, this woman says that uh, this, the directive from the State Department was just get to the airport, but there was nothing beyond that. And, and so she felt like she was sort of helpless. Now, there, without an American military presence in Afghanistan right now, her family tells me that they fear that uh, she may not get out. They're not exactly sure how, at this point, they are going to get her out. Nicole? Yeah, that's, uh, so many questions still. Joe, thank you for that. Joe's full exclusive interview airs tonight on News Nation Prime. All right, let's turn now to the pandemic. Florida, the epicenter currently of the latest surge. COVID hospitalizations at an all time high there, and healthcare workers are feeling the strain. News Nation's Jeff Patterson from our Tampa station, WFLA, spoke to nurses at a hospital there about how they are handling this surge. 
So far, more than 4,570 people have been admitted to Tampa General Hospital with COVID-19. More than 4,000 have recovered, but sadly, some will not go home alive, and that's taking a real toll on the staff here. Inside the COVID unit at Tampa General Hospital, they've been dealing with very sick people for months. For last summer, with COVID starting, um, we didn't get that break. Paige Pajaj is a frontline nurse. We are constantly working you know, to our hardest or fullest every shift, and we're having sicker patients than ever. This is the cardiothoracic ICU yes, you. dealing with COVID patients. And these patients are in respiratory distress, and it's it's not just for a week or two. We're talking about uh, weeks and months. This is some of the most critical care that can be given and requires constant monitoring by the nursing staff. Unfortunately, a lot of them aren't making it through. So it's been taking a toll on us for sure. Now the staff here is seeing more patients than ever before. The second wave has definitely been um, worse. It's been more patients. The patients are younger. They're sicker. And for the staff at Tampa General Hospital, the work is nonstop. We're tired. Um, I think that at the end of the day, we, you know, we are we're, we're fatigued, but we still come to work and we still take care of our patients because that's what we're committed to doing. Right now, more than 90% of the people in the COVID ICU are people who have not been vaccinated. The message from the staff here is get the vaccine. In Tampa, I'm Jeff Patterson. Now back to you, Nicole. All right, Jeff, thank you for that. All right, this is a look right now at Hawaii, where an Illinois woman is behind bars. She was arrested at a Honolulu airport for using a fake vaccination card. News Station correspondent Rudabe Shabazi is live for us tonight in Oakland, Illinois. That is a suburb of Chicago. So, Rudabe, it sounds like the woman was trying to bypass Hawaii's quarantine rule. That's what it sounds like, Nicole. That's what authorities say. The FBI was actually involved in this, and this is something we're seeing more and more of as Americans try to skirt these restrictions and these vaccine mandates. So in this woman's case, she came from Illinois. Authorities say she used a fake vaccine card. She hand wrote on that on the card that she had received two of the shots from Delaware, but she misspelled Moderna. So as you can imagine, that raised some red flags at the airport. And then to complicate matters and make them even more confusing, the person at the airport neglected to screen her hotel. So she also lied about where she was staying, allegedly. And then they couldn't find her after she went through the screening process in Hawaii. This was all to avoid the 10 day quarantine uh, mandate in Hawaii. But authorities did catch up with her when she was trying to leave the island at the Southwest Airlines ticket counter. The FBI got involved. People started investigating and uh, you can see the card there that it didn't quite seem uh, legitimate that there were some red flags raised. So they caught up with her at the airport. She is now behind bars at last check and uh, she is charged with misdemeanor a $5,000 fine and up to a year in prison. Right now she's being held on $2,000 bond. And this is not an isolated incident, Nicole. There was also a couple from Florida just weeks ago who also got arrested in Hawaii. And they went as far as making fake cards for their four and five-year-old children as well. All right, so she, she went to Hawaii, enjoyed her vacation, thought she was going to head home, and police said not happening. All right, Rita Bay, thank you. The country's toughest abortion law takes effect in Texas. Supporters rejoicing as protesters rally outside the state capitol. Why the U.S. Supreme Court is not stepping in. Welcome back to Rush Hour. Here's what's happening in your nation right now. And we do start with breaking news. This is out of North Carolina. A high school student shot and killed and the suspected gunman, who police say is also a student, now in custody. It happened in the Winston-Salem area, the school where that shooting took place on lockdown for hours as law enforcement hunted for the shooter. He was just taken into custody minutes ago. No other injuries are reported. Power slowly starting to come back to parts of Louisiana, devastated earlier this week by Hurricane Ida. But anger and frustration growing as people there also dealing with water and gas shortages. 
and intense heat and humidity. President Biden does plan to visit New Orleans Friday to get a first-hand look at the damage. The Caldor Fire, now less than three miles from the Lake Tahoe region. As fire crews continue working around the clock, winds and humidity have made things challenging, with evacuation orders now expanding across the state line into Nevada. Authorities say, though, the next few hours are crucial as winds are expected to calm overnight. The pro tennis world lost one of their own last night. Julie Diddy Qualls, who retired from the sport in 2012 and had been playing tennis since the age of three. She also played around the world, including Wimbledon. Diddy Qualls died of breast cancer last night in her home state of Kentucky. She was just 42 years old. Well, it's not often you hear about a high school football team making headlines for losing. But that's exactly the case for an Ohio team after they were crushed on national TV. The game so lopsided, it led some to question why the two teams were even matched up. It happened Sunday. Bishop Sycamore completely mismatched Bad with a painful 58 to nothing loss to perennial powerhouse IMG Academy out of Florida. Now, plenty of people noticed uh, the pretty significant difference in skill level, including the ESPN play-by-play -play team, even though Bishop Sycamore claimed to have several athletes with Division I offers. They did not show up in our database. They did not show up in the databases of other recruiting services. So it's okay. If that's what you're telling us, fine. That's how we take it in. All right. You hear a little suspicion there. Uh, now Ohio Governor Mike DeWine calling for an investigation into Bishop Sycamore to find out if it is even an actual school. News Nation correspondent Paul Gerke is here tonight. So, Paul, Please help make some sense of this. Why is the governor suspicious? We're talking it, maybe not even a school? Well, aren't you suspicious right now? Nicole, we're all pretty suspicious at this point. So we'll start with the latest. According to police reports, somebody at Bishop Sycamore tried to pass some bad checks at the Canton Hotel the team stayed at over the weekend. Those checks total around $3,600 and were used to pay for the 25 rooms the Columbus team used before its game against IMG. Nobody has been charged for that just yet. Earlier this week, head coach Roy Johnson was fired by the program's athletic director. It turns out Johnson has his own active bench warrant and pending fraud charges, not to mention the danger he put his kids in on Sunday night. From what we've seen so far, this is not a fair fight, and, and there's got to be a point now where you do worry about health and safety. And that was Bishop Sycamore's second game in three days. Unheard of at any level. They lost to a Pennsylvania school last Friday. Paragon Marketing Group, which schedules the matchups for ESPN, says they didn't know about that or they would not have allowed Sunday's game to be played. And the rabbit hole goes even deeper. If you're looking up the supposed online charter school's address to send a strongly worded letter, good luck because you're going to find a duplex, an athletic center, or a public library instead. Bishop Sycamore's website offers nothing about any class information or staff, and it's not clear if it actually offers classes at all. The website is currently down. Now, this will be the meat of Governor DeWine's investigation. Are these kids getting an education? Are they even kids at all? There are reports of fake recruiting profiles and players older than high school age abound, yet there were definitely real people trying their best on Sunday night. So why are they playing for Bishop Sycamore? Nicole, this is partially a story of young athletes hoping somehow to get a quality highlight tape together, maybe to play at the next level to have a shot they wouldn't otherwise get from another school. But you just end up feeling bad for them that the adults making decisions in this process led them here. Yeah, and if they don't have high school transcripts of actual classes. Oh, okay, Paul, so what about the rest of their schedule? Is Bishop Sycamore, is the team still going to play? Yeah, so we had a different answer to this question earlier this morning. That's actually the latest domino to fall, Nicole. As of this morning, about half of that schedule was still intact. But as of right now, it looks like Bishop Sycamore's bizarre season is over. Those remaining teams have officially pulled out today. And oh, one more thing before I let you go, Nicole. I hate to break your heart with this one, but the Diocese of Columbus, Ohio, has never had a Bishop Sycamore ever in its history. So even the school's namesake never existed. All right. So, Paul, the takeaway from this, we know that real people played in Sunday's game. That's at least we think so. Takeaway. Maybe okay. it was all in our heads. All right, Paul, thank you for that. Well, the nation's strictest abortion law now in effect in Texas. Why the Supreme Court is saying it will not step in. And of course, people across the South still reeling from destruction left behind by Hurricane Ida. Now two members of a Mississippi family are fighting for their lives after their car was flung to the ground during that bridge collapse.
This is the scene in Texas today. Protesters outside the state capitol as the nation's most restrictive abortion law takes effect. News Nation's Monica Madden with our Austin station KXAN is joining us live. So, Monica, tell us what's in this new law and why the Supreme Court is choosing not to intervene. Well, Nicole, pro-choice advocates had put in an emergency request order to the United States Supreme Court to block this from becoming law. And pro-choice groups had issues with the way it's written. It's written so that way abortions are banned as soon as a fetal heartbeat is detected. And that can be as early as six weeks. So pro-choice groups are saying, you know, that most women don't even know that they are pregnant at this point. Uh, of course, pro-life people saying that, you know, this is this is protecting life and they are happy happy to see it in Texas. Ultimately, the Supreme Court did not take up the emergency request. They were silent on it. So by midnight, when this law went into effect today, uh, the Supreme Court hadn't responded. So now this law is in effect in Texas, Nicole. All right, so Monica, explain part of this law. Basically, regular people can report each other. Is that how it works? Yeah, that's exactly right, Nicole. What's different from this law is it tried to kind of avoid some of the legal, potential legal challenges that we see in several other states when there are abortion restrictions and those get challenged and then struck down by the courts. This one, by prohibiting, you know, the government and officials from enforcing it, it kind of supersedes those potentials for legal challenges. And instead, it puts the, the lawsuit action in the hands of everyday citizens, everyday Texans. So theoretically speaking, an average Texan can, you know, know a friend that got an abortion after six weeks and then sue the provider for doing that. And it also allows citizens to sue anyone who aided or um, abetted in that abortion procedure. So it really just allows citizens to do it. And that's kind of how it gets around uh, the the previous challenges we see with other state laws and their restrictions. And Nicole, I want to point out too that at any point the United States Supreme Court could decide to block this law and could, uh, you know, take some action on challenges that we're going to see. So that's kind of where things stand here in Texas. Nicole, back All to right. you. Yeah, so definitely uh, unique there. So Monica, thank you for explaining that. Still ahead, two dead, others fighting for their lives after that bridge collapse in Mississippi. Tonight, family members are demanding answers. Tonight, we are following up on that deadly highway collapse in George County, Mississippi. We brought this to you as breaking news last night. Torrential rain after Hurricane Ida left a highway split in two. The video just incredible. Now we know two people died, at least 10 others injured, including a mother and daughter now in the hospital fighting for their lives. News Station correspondent Janelle Fort spoke to relatives of that mother and daughter about their recovery. It's a, a crazy thing. I mean, the, for the, this hole to just open up and swallow all these cars. It's a thought Shanna Borderland has circled back to multiple times as she waits anxiously outside the University of Southern Alabama Hospital in Mobile for any updates on her niece, Emily. Inside, the 16-year-old is undergoing multiple surgeries. At another hospital nearly two hours away, her sister-in-law, Amanda, is on a ventilator fighting for her life. It's scary. It's very scary. The pair were in one of the seven cars swallowed into a dark hole Monday night when torrential rain spawning from Hurricane Ida caused a George County, Mississippi highway to collapse. Two men died. Ten people, including the mom and daughter, were hurt. As they were rolling up, she said they saw it, but it was too late and there was nothing they could do. They plunged nearly 20 feet. They were the third, the third vehicle on that pile. There was a truck, another truck, and then their truck. Photos of their gray pickup show the impact of the fall and paint an extraordinary tale of survival. It's crazy, but then you look at my niece in there who's in a neck brace and she's got equipment sticking out of her legs and IVs all over her and she's in pain. And then thinking about my sister-in-law who no one has seen because they won't let us in and that she's fighting for her life. And I mean, it's, it, it does make you angry angry because Borderland says this road has been a problem spot for a while. 
It's an asphalt band-aid that they keep slapping on top of it. If that would have been fixed properly, we wouldn't be standing here. Now, there's a full investigation into this collapse. We just saw crews out here surveying the area. This road is going to be cut, is going to be shut down for the foreseeable future. And Nicole, uh, you have to understand that there are so many questions surrounding how something like this could even happen. Yeah, absolutely. It's certainly something we don't tend to see. Uh, Janelle, thank you for that. And on rush hour, a new Twitter safety feature trying to fight those unwelcome tweets temporary temporarily blocking accounts using what they deem to be harmful language. Live from our News Nation headquarters in Chicago, here's a look at what's happening in your nation right now. A federal bankruptcy judge has conditionally approved a $10 billion plan submitted by Purdue Pharma to settle lawsuits over its role in the opioid crisis. The settlement calls for the Sackler family to give up ownership of the company while shielded from future litigation, along with the setup of a compensation fund. Purdue Pharma will become a new company with a board appointed by public officials. A judge in Georgia not allowing attorneys for the men charged with killing Ahmaud Arbery to use evidence of his past in the upcoming trial. The judge saying a victim's character is not relevant, relevant nor admissible in a murder case. Father and son Gregory and Travis McMichael and their neighbor William Bryan are accused of chasing and fatally shooting Arbery last year and it was all captured on cell phone video. A group of agents from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms and Explosives in Phoenix and Detroit will be the first federal agents to wear body cameras. Attorney General Merrick Garland made that announcement today as part of a new Justice Department policy that reverses a years long ban. All agents will eventually be required to wear those cameras when executing arrest warrants or searching buildings. And Twitter rolling out a new safety feature that temporarily blocks accounts for seven days for using potentially harmful language or sending repetitive and uninvited replies or mentions. The feature will need to be turned on in settings. The system will then automatically assess a tweet's content and the relationship between the sender and receiver. Twitter says this is a test and the company wants users to enjoy healthy conversations. And police found no evidence of foul play after investigating an explosion at this Arizona print shop last week, saying it was a result of an unintentional gas leak. Four people were hurt. That is all for Rush Hour tonight. Thanks for joining us. Next up, the Donlin Report later tonight on Balance with Leland Bittert, News Nation Prime, and Banfield.